Thank you very much. Uh, I was indeed in the uh, Ecole Française uh, forum, but as you've seen, I have changed affiliations uh, in the meantime. Uh, I'm sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I didn't know where I, I would be when I had okay, okay. affiliations with the organizers. So this is, uh, I, I had to go with, with what I had uh, at the time. Uh, so I'd like to thank the organizers for giving us this opportunity to meet and exchange ideas and for me to uh, give you an insight um, uh, about Jerome and Karen Jean Lyon. So, Karen Jean Lyon, it's, uh, it's a given uh, milieu, intellectual milieu, and you have here uh, an overview of the main figures uh, of uh, the intellectual life. So, four, four bishops. Obviously, there were bishops before and after these four, but we had no evidence of their involvement into intellectual life, so I let them out. Flores, the deacon Flores, which is the main, uh, the most important figure here, and Mano, from uh, about whom we will not speak uh, today, but he's an important figure too, so I thought he deserved to be mentioned. Uh, more than the people, more than the figures, uh, what's remarkable about the Carolingian Lyon is the great amount of first-hand materials that have been preserved. Uh, Lyon's intellectual life uh, is witnessed by about 150 manuscripts, which is a lot, uh, and about 100 works that were composed by the people that had uh, these very books at hand. Uh, and the most interesting is that we can sometimes uh, cross-reference what they did in their books, what they did in their books with what they did in their books. Here we go. So let's take a look at the preserved manuscripts containing Jerome's works. If you're not familiar with the books of manuscript tradition, uh, I just tell you that uh, this list by itself is impressive. Uh, we have three manuscripts prior to the 9th century, uh, which are pretty rare. We have two manuscripts that belong to uh, two of the bishops I mentioned earlier. And in, uh, altogether, we have more than uh, 10 uh, to 12 uh, manuscripts uh, that were present or produced in Lyon in our period, and that's only the preserved manuscripts. Now, Jerome is quoted very often in the works composed by Leon Perix uh, at the time, but here we will examine one of these works in particular because it has, it can work as a nucleus from which uh, we will, we can investigate various aspects of Leon's uh, Hieronymian culture. Uh, and this is, it is Flores's uh, Hieronymian compilation on the Apostle. Uh, which is a gathering of 265 extracts uh, where Jerome explains a passage from Paul, uh, from Paul's corpus, including the Hebrews. As you can see, Flores took his extracts from uh, 44 genuine writings Jerome's and three pseudo Jerome here. We'll come back to this later. And uh, you should also know that this compilation is not isolated. Uh, it is one piece in a series um, of similar compilation that Flores uh, undertook on a variety of opera, following always the same method. The first, uh, the one I put on the top here, uh, has uh, met, has encountered success. Uh, it has been reference works for scholars, uh, Augustinian scholars from the Middle Ages to this day. Uh, it is, and on the contrary, uh, the others remained almost completely buried. Uh, the first series of 12 are known only to by two later manuscripts, and they, and they were published until recently. And lastly, Gerald and Gregory the Great are to be found together uh, and published still in three manuscripts where we will need to go study them directly in the manuscripts. So, as I told you before, uh, the most interesting things happen when we can map.
match what happens in the writings with what happens in the manuscripts. And for example, here uh, we have Jerome's commentary on Jeremy. And in our list of manuscripts, we have this copy here of the same commentary. Contemporary. Um, this manuscript is fairly well preserved. You can see here the gray. parts of the manuscripts are uh, not too uh, big. Um, and if you leave through the manuscript, you will see uh, things uh, like this. I'll do it like this. So you have an opening bracket here with a page for capitals in the margin, closing bracket with an S for finish, and here you have a sign that stands for the Philippians, of the Epistle to the Philippians. And if you go in Francis' congregation, you will find the exact same passage in the section, in the section commenting uh, the Epistle to the Philippians with the right reference. So when you go through the manuscripts, you will find nine preparations alike, so similar to the one I showed you, that match nine of the eleven extracts on the Two, the two remaining extracts were in the last part. So we cannot check the preparations, but we can use the extracts to have an idea, a fairly accurate idea of the full text of the manuscript for this last part. And uh, interestingly, in two other instances here and there, you will find exactly the same preparations, exactly the same marks, traces but no extract in the compilation, which, uh, which suggests that there was some kind of uh, intermediate selection phase here that we have no, uh, we have no other way of uh, uh, witnessing. Another interesting case is this match of knowing Cambridge. Um, it is known mostly as an extant copy of the Codex Marconesis, which is a hugely important manuscript for Einstein, um, and um, which was also the source for several extracts of Flores, uh, which Flores took in this manuscript several extracts from two other collections on the Apostle of Augustine and Paulinus of Noah. Uh, now, after he, when, he, when, he, when, when, when the copyist finished uh, copying the extant collection of Agnesis, they went on and copied um, the, and copied other texts uh, after after the, the same the te same copies. And the first of them is here is Jerome's Episode 65, a text from which Flores took two extracts in his compilation, but from which actual manuscripts? The Cambridge manuscript, despite having having been produced probably as Flores was alive. This manuscript doesn't have Flores' autograph marks, as you have seen uh, on the previous manuscript. But uh, here, we will, the copyist copied a sign, a national sign for the first person to the Corinthians, at the exact intensity of the first extract, of Flores' first extract. Apostles Kiet. And if you uh, turn the few pages, we find this. So, but this is the second extract from the first compilation. You will find the marginal K right at the limit of uh, the extracts. You will find this Hebrew sign here, where Jerome says, Hop in the in Greco pro significant, and it matches uh, the place where the dilemma uh, that Flores intended to comment with this extract. And the manuscript here, and Flores, in agreement with this manuscript here, has hot and significant, which is very peculiar, very intriguing, unknown to the last editor of uh, this episode, uh, which confirms that there is a strong proximity between uh, this particular witness and Flores' compilation. So, 
The coverage management is not forest resource management, we lost it. But uh, it's copied after they had copied a forest resource from Arcanensis. Uh, they went on in the same library, they picked other books in the same library, and they copied forest resource management of the so 65, thus providing us with both a direct witness of Jerome's text and an indirect witness to Forrest's work on this text. Another case leads us <coughs> to other directions. Jerome's commentary on Isaiah is by far the most important source of our population, as you can see. And here again, we can uh, turn to a preserved manuscript. And we are lucky too, because this one too uh, is well preserved. And on the very last page of the book here, we find Nadra's personal uh, and autograph external that we know from a few other books. This is significant because uh, Nadra uh, here was a personal friend of Alcuin's and Charlemagne's and Anne of Salzburg and Theodore of Orleans, and he was the one who wrote Carangian, uh, reformed the Carangian program to Lyon. He's the one with, with whom uh, this whole activity in Lyon started. Um, so in this manuscript, as in the commentary on Jeremy, you will find similar preparations that will also match extracts. In process compilation. Opening bracket with K as a sign for Timothy, closing bracket and a matching extract in the section on the first episode to Timothy. In fact, uh, there is um, 58 of the extracts can be matched with their preparations in this match all fall into the grey area here in the lost parts of the um, on the other hand, you can see that no less than 13 extracts were prepared on the manuscripts and not reflected in the compilation, which, speak, which speaks uh, once more uh, about the selection process in the middle, of which we have no archaeological trace. Mm. But if you look at this picture here, again, you might notice that the traces of Horace's work are not the only traces. In fact, there is another series of brackets opening here with a flourish, closing brackets erased, a flourish here with another bracket erased here, and this closing bracket here works with this one too. Uh, as you can see, Flores erased these brackets because they were in the way of his own extract, of the extracts he, was, he wanted to do on, for, for his uh, project in Paul. Uh, it means that before, because of course if you want to go from here to here and you meet this bracket, you don't know that you should go down to here. Okay. So, it's better to erase it. It's easy. It means that before Florence's project to extract, uh, to, extract to extract passages on pole, um, another project had been conducted on the same text on the same manuscript. And uh, in fact, this prior project ex extends through the whole manuscript because the person doing this uh, was trying to abbreviate Jerome's huge commentary on his eye, to do a reader's digest of Jerome's commentary on his eye. And Floris could erase his, his preparation box because uh, this project, this prior project, was already finished. Uh, it had been the, the reader's digest had been published and it has been read. Uh, at least three copies, three copies were produced over about uh, 50 years in Lyon. And later on it was also used uh, to fill a lacuna in a branch of Amos Overseer's comment on his side. There is also a witness to this, to the lasting interest of the Reader's Digest of uh, Jerome, uh, to the trial of Reader's Digest. The lasting uh, witness uh, is uh, with the fact that 
special training commission for owned a copy. And this copy has been read by Ricky Ramos, an unknown cleric, probably a humble, simple cleric, not a great intellectual, who is very uh, who is improvising the best poetry he can on this copy to show how proud and grateful he is for having read this book. But let's go back to the origins of Laidra's copy, the source of Horace's compilation. Despite uh, the legitimate impression that this is a lengthy copy of Jerome's 18, 18 books on his island, Bryson and his collaborators have shown that this is a bit more, it is a bit more complicated. Jerome never published uh, 18 books on his island as a whole. He published parts here, parts there, and uh, it is the medieval people who searched these parts and put them together. With later as copy, we witness one of these attempts to do a complete work. Books 1 to, have, to 5 have a good traceability, as you can see. They descend from northern Italian uh, copies, still preserved. Pretty. Wow. This, is, wow. this is easy. Uh, books, to six, books 6 to 9 were then added as a whole, but they don't belong to, belong to the same tradition, and even among themselves, they don't belong to the same traditions. And finally, the last nine books were added also at once, all together, but only in an abbreviated form. And Bryson says that's probably because later I couldn't find an extant copy of these books. But I, I rather think that Leidrat genuinely believed that these were the extant books and the later abbreviator, Ionez abbreviator, also thought so, and Floros, when he did his compilation, also, also thought so. This relates to another aspect. I have the reason to believe that, yes, I have a reason to believe that uh, Jerome's was the very first compilation that uh, Flores undertook and made in, this, in the whole series. There are a lot of arguments that I cannot summarize uh, here, but the commentary on Isaiah gives us material to compare what Flores did in, in this compilation and what he was capable to do at the end of this period. Uh, like I said, the compilation takes extracts from three pseudo Jerome texts. This is not uncommon. And even Flores was mistaken by Flores' attributions when he was young. But the texts from his last years uh, show us how much he had learned in the meantime by his assiduous reading of the Fathers. In, in 852, a neighbor bishop consulted the Church of Lyon on the authenticity of two patristic texts. First, the Hippodestican attributed to Augustine. Flores knew this text and he refuted the authenticity based on several arguments, uh, both internal and external. Second, the Indulazione Corpus Paralum, as you can see here, Cardinal uh, says that denying its authenticity is a lie because Jerome himself says that he wrote this book in the book 17 on his side. The first answer is that he couldn't find this book in the ancient lists of genuine works by Jerome. And in Book 17 on Isaiah, he doesn't really say he wrote the day in the Indoration of his family, but that he spoke about this matter uh, more generally uh, as since because Paul treated it in his episode in the world. But he says he never saw this book, so we cannot evaluate the style of thinking of the author. And therefore, he, he could not say, could not pronounce on authenticity. <coughs> so in today's words, he's saying that external arguments don't play in favor of authenticity. But, he, but since he cannot uh, do the internal examination, he reserves his job. So at the peak of his career, this man has a method to evaluate the authenticity of texts attributed to this or that father, father and a good method. 
this is roughly the same methods we use uh, today. And this method he could have applied to this free text used in his compilation as if there were journals. But, uh, but we also need to pay attention to what he says about Book 17 on his eye. So let's look at this more, uh, okay, more carefully, more closely. Firstly, we can compare what he says here with what Jerome actually says. And we can see that Flores merely paraphrases him in just reform bits. But if we compare that with Leidrat's copy of Jerome's text, we have a problem. Leidrat's copy has basically the same text as Price's, uh, but the last sentence is missing. And this is, it is a sentence where Jerome says that he knows something about it. The people who did the abbreviation that came to Leidrat probably thought this information was useless. But in any case, Flores couldn't have found this information, he, the information he gives in this copy, nor the very peculiar uh, string area that he uses in agreement with the crisis. This means that when Pathos told him, go check Jerome's book, Seventeen on Design, and Flores did so, and he took a book on the shelf, and he opened it at, at Book 17 on his eye, and he looked for the passage and he found it. Uh, the book he took on the shelf, his authoritative copy of Jerome's commentary on his eye, at this time, was no longer a dress copy. At some point, after he had made his compilation, and before 852, uh, the Lion Library got hold of an extant copy of uh, books 10 to 18, and they realized then that Laidra's copy uh, was an abbreviated version from the <coughs> So to conclude, conclusions, what I would like to convey through all these details here is that medieval approaches to Jerome or any church fathers, any church father covers a whole range of situations. Flores personally undertook every one of these activities I saw here. Somebody who is capable of collecting manuscripts to check the best readings is also capable of compiling thematic anthologies. They just will not deploy the same type of expertise in this or that context. So, to understand what medieval people did with these texts, it's requires not only to ask ourselves who did it and how they did it, but also for whom they did it, to what intent and for what public. They were not working at random and they were not working for us. The fact that they transmitted the text to us is a collateral benefit of their work, but they were primarily working for themselves and for their time, sometimes for scholars, sometimes for simpler clerics, exactly as we do in our time with the same diversity of approaches that still exist today in our editorial, uh, in our books, in the books we produce. So the current union offers a great amount of textual and material evidence uh, to a variety of activities that were undertaken on Jerome's uh, writings over the course of roughly 75 years. These activities were aiming at uh, a dissemination of Jerome's thoughts and figure into, uh, say, a more general public, a medieval common culture, so to say. But at the same time, they directly impacted the text textual traditions uh, that we need to reconstruct if we are to provide Jerome's uh, texts for our time with critical features. The specialists of Jerome, I am not a specialist of Jerome, I am a specialist of the specialists of Jerome are very welcome and I'd be very happy 